Thanks for coming to this Austin School event. Uh, we have Rabbi Lev Bayesh, and sticking to Austin School tradition, we're just going to let him introduce himself. So here he is. Okay. You get the mic, by the way, this thing. You have to take it in case people need it. I don't want to take it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so the first thing I was asked when I came here um, was, do you have PowerPoints? And I do not have any PowerPoints, because I hate PowerPoints. Um, I'm, a, I'm a rabbi, I'm a lawyer, and I'm also a nurse. And I went, when I went to nursing school, they used to call it death by PowerPoint. That was the, um, what, what classroom participation was. Um, so, I, so I don't have that. Um, and, uh, and I also, um, I'm here to talk about the Palestinian-Israeli, Israeli-Palestinian conflict in history and on, on the planet, uh, some lead up to it, where we are now. Um, I am not an expert in any of that subject. I do, however, have, um, I've studied this a lot, um, and I, uh, I've lived in Israel. Um, I have uh, some life in the West Bank um, and, uh, and have done some work there uh, and also in Gaza. And I, um, and I, and I do a lot of work on uh, kind of thinking about the possibility and creating programs around peace in the Middle East. Um, so there are a couple of... Um, a couple of ground rules for this conversation. One is uh, being respectful of everybody. That, that's something that I hope we can do when we talk. Um, you need to know that I come from Philadelphia. I was, um, I was taught how to curse by my grandmother. Um, her nickname for me was um, the little bitch and shithead. She used to call me that. So, so my language, my, my sort of frame of language is probably different than many of you grew up with. Um, although some maybe not. Um, I also, my father is, um, is probably like number one on, if you look in the dictionary under sarcasm, his picture is there. So, um, so if I say something and it sounds offensive, like I'm making fun of you, I probably am. That's sarcasm. But anyway, um, uh, no, I, uh, so sometimes, so you can actually say to me, like, do you, like tone it down, are you like? Are you mad at me? Or you know, just ask me questions and I'll clear it up. Because the truth is, um, I'm not. I uh, I'm, I'm probably the most friendly person you'll ever meet. With a really like hard, I talk like this. Um, so uh, uh, when um, when I was asked when Roy asked me um, to if I wanted to do this talk tonight, he asked me for a title. Um, and so one of the things I learned in rabbinic school is that you have to be able to come up with a title in the moment when you're giving a sermon for like six months down the road that you have no idea what you're going to talk about because you got to put it in the newsletter and people are going to want to know what you're talking about and you need to have a title that can fit anything. So I came up with this, uh, what was the title? The art of the deal, yeah, because that's popu popular title today, and um, and and there's something about the Israeli-Palestinian uh, question around whether a deal could be made. Um, but as I was planning for today, I had a different title in mind. <clears throat> it's called um, bias, Bible, and bullshit. That those three things are really basically the whole conversation. That if you think about what's going on in the Middle East as a combination of people's bias, of our, um, everybody's individual and group understanding of what Bible means and what's in it, um, and, um, and then the kind of stuff that gets added on top of it, like life history and, um, and people wanting to fight with each other and uh, everybody having an opinion and wanting to be right, that's the bullshit part. And I think all of it together uh, builds this um, particular conflict. A little about my history, um, and you can interrupt any time you want, raise your hand, ask questions. We do, they do want to get you on mic uh, because we're being videotaped, and, um, and I'll make them cut out all the parts where I curse through the whole thing, but a uh, um, little about my history. So I'm gonna, I was born in the U.S. My parents were born in the U.S. My grandparents were all born in the U.S., my great-grandparents came to the United States from Russia and Poland um, when, 
during, during a period of time in the late 18, early 1900s when it was not safe to be Jewish in Russia and Poland, um, and their families were being massacred, and all their property was stolen, and they, they were fairly poor anyway, but everything was taken from them, and they came to the United States, many of them. Some of them went to um, what later became Palestine and then Israel, and, um, uh, and some of them went to South America, uh, and, uh, and some of them uh, kind of moved around in Europe. But my family, my grandparents' parents all came to the United States, set up life here. Um, on my mother's side, I am uh, seventh generation rabbi living in the United States. I'm sorry, fifth generation rabbi living in the United States. Um, and my mother would have been a rabbi if she had been male, but there were no male rabbis at the time. Um, but her two sisters married rabbis, so they kept, the, they kept the line going. So I'm fifth generation rabbi in the United States. The last three generations were liberal, but my grandfather, who was the first of that three generations, was raised ultra-Orthodox. And so if you see, um, not around here you're not going to see it, but if you see pictures or movies or you lived somewhere else, where there are Jews where the men have black hats and curls and long black coats and the women cover their heads um, and look very much the same way that traditional Muslim women do. Um, uh, that's the ultra-Orthodox community and that's the community that uh, my family came from originally. And as a rabbi, I, I go back in an unbroken line through my mother to, the, to 1700 with uh, the founder of the Hasidic movement in Judaism, which is Jewish mysticism. So that's, um, uh, that's a movement in Judaism that um, where, where kind of the term spirituality comes from. Instead of religion being something that you study and you read and you focus on the books, it's much more focused on your heart and your experience and your relationship to the universe, to nature and to, um, to humanity. And it's, a, it's less sort of focused in the book and more focused um, in the world. Um, so when I was growing up, I grew up in a family where my father was an attorney and my father's brother was an attorney and my mother's family, all the men were rabbis and I'm the firstborn in my generation so I had to do a little of everything. So the first thing I did was I went to law school. I, went, I, I got a, a, psych, a BA in psychology with a minor in biology and I, then I went to law school, and I worked in Manhattan and I, uh, in New York City, um, keeping kids out of court. Um, and I think some of you look familiar, but <laughs> the, um, mostly the guys on the wall over there. But no, but the, um, uh, there's, that's the sarcastic piece. Um, so, uh, so, my, so basically my job was, um, I worked with parents and teenagers in mediation, and I would work in family court in Manhattan and keep the kids from being taken away from their parents because of things like truancy and, and, and minor violent offenses and, um, and theft and things like that. And then I realized after a couple of years that I, um, I needed to do something else and something bigger than just kind of working one-on-one -on -one with people. And so I decided to do what the other family business, which was to go to become a rabbi. And um, is there anybody here who has never met a rabbi before? I just see, anybody? Okay. Now you can say, you can't say that anymore. <laughs> so um, uh, so I, I decided to go to rabbinic school and the first year of rabbinic school is in Jerusalem for the liberal movement in Judaism, for the reform movement. And, um, and so I lived in Jerusalem that year. It was 1989 to 1990. But I actually went to Israel the very first time when I was 14 years old. I was, um, I was a little precocious. I, um, I didn't like living. We were in Miami at the time. I didn't like living there. And so I, I found this trip to Israel where you could go to high school in Israel. And I was the youngest kid on the program. And I went to Israel and I lived there for a summer and then I, and I, and then I did my high school year there and then I came back to the United States for 10th grade. And, um, 
And then I went back the next year on a trip because I thought that I wanted to become a citizen of Israel and I was going to join the military at 15, which is, I'm way too young for that. But, um, but I was pretty sure that I wanted, and, and I'm also a pacifist, and I was also sure that I wanted to join the military because, um, because I believed very strongly that Israel uh, needed me because that's what they told me in Sunday school every um, week while I was growing up. And, um, and so, uh, so I went back to Israel. I was 15 years old. I lived on an um, Air Force base um, built into a mountainside in, uh, overlooking uh, Jordan, um, overlooking the valley uh, into Jordan. It was gorgeous. It was beautiful countryside. We were in a, basically a, an entire city in the mountain with no, you couldn't see it from anywhere because it was completely protected in the hill. I lived there for a while, um, and then, and one of the programs that the, uh, so I was, I was 15, so one of the programs that the instructor uh, who took us there wanted us to do, and he was a, a military um, colonel, he was sort of at the highest level in the Air Force in that particular division, he, um, he said, you now have to go live with a Palestinian family for a couple of weeks, and I I'm like, why? You know, why? And back then, actually, it was a, it, it was, there was no issue. In fact, when you would hitchhike, when you got to Israel, you leave the United States where they told you never, ever get in a car with a stranger. As you're going to Israel, what they tell you is, this is how you hitchhike. You put your finger out. You don't do this. You do this. You put your finger out. You point down. And anybody will stop and pick you up. And it doesn't matter who it is, what color their skin is, where they come from, what language they speak, what nationality, what their uh, language is. Um, anybody can pick you up. And one of the most wonderful things is that when the Palestinians would pick you up, they would take you home and feed you, and, and you could bathe at their house, and you could stay there with them. And there was no, um, it was like, if, if I'm going to pick you up, we're going to take care of you. If an Israeli family or somebody from Israel picked you up, they would ask where you wanted to go, and they would drop you there. And it was a real kind of wake-up for me about sort of a, a, like what hospitality looks like from different cultures and where we were. And I, I'm an American. I'm Jewish. Uh, uh, I'm white. I, um, you know, they, they know who I am when I'm there. And I was, uh, this is how I was welcomed in. It was, it was very interesting to me as a 14-year-old. When I went back at 15, it was even more confusing that this military leader wanted me to go live with a Palestinian family. And... Um, and when we were done, he wouldn't tell us actually what it was about. He just said, this is part of the program. You have to do it. And when we came back, he was like, I, I just want you to know if there's ever trouble, like you need to know that who you're, um, who you're opposing is somebody that you actually can become friends with. Like that this is not, there's not them out there and us over here. This is us and us and we're all us. And if there's conflict you have to behave like a human being. That was, that was what I was taught. I went into the Israeli scouts, which is unlike the United States um, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, the Israeli scouts is actually preparation for the military. So you carry a gun. I had a, um, uh, a rifle that I carried. I did border patrol on a kibbutz, on a little um, village that I lived in. I did border patrol with my Israeli counterpart. Um, I never was taught how to use the gun. I just had to carry it. And um, uh, I never fired it. And I'm not even sure there was anything in it. It just, uh, no ammunition. But I, but I had to sort of look the part while I was out there um, in the, walking the perimeter. Um, so that was my experience, 14 and 15. Everything was easy in Israel. There were no borders. There were no... You couldn't go to that village, but you could go to this one. You couldn't ride that bus, but you could ride this one. You had to look over your shoulder. There wasn't, if somebody got on the bus, if a Palestinian got on the bus and they had a box that they were carrying and they said, could you help me? Or if, or if you saw somebody that needed help, you could just take it from them and say, let me hold that for you. Like there was no question about that. And then, um, and then things started to shift, and, uh, and so um, my experience shifted a bit. So I lived with this family in a town um, in the northern part of Israel, 
And, um, and the, the, the guy that I was my age, who I had started to become friends with, um, his uh, father was the mayor of the um, Arab village there. And, uh, and so I got, um, I got to know him and his family, um, and, and, and I was a part of their house for just a week. But, um, but when I would go back to Israel after that, I would go to see them. That was part of my, like, why I wanted to be there. I also had Israeli friends. In fact, there was a family in Haifa in the northern part of Israel that, um, that uh, like, if I wanted to stay and my airline ticket was a week later or something, I could just go to their house, knock on the door, and they would let me in because their nephew and I went to high school together on that program. Um, they were one very friendly family. Turns out that as Jews, however, they were from the Middle East. They weren't Western Jews. They were um, Arab Jews, which I don't think a lot of people understand that um, to be Arab doesn't make you Muslim and to be Muslim doesn't make you Arab. And, um, and, uh, and that there's a... Uh, and also to be... Jews don't all come from uh, Europe and from North America. There are Jews who are Yemenites and Jews who are Iraqi and Jews who are... Um, African and, uh, and Chinese Jews, and so we all have our culture and we have our religion, and sometimes it merges, and sometimes they're very different from each other, um, and we tend to look like everybody else in the world. Oh, hi, Sherry. I see you. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so I was 14 and 15 on my two trips to Israel, um, and then I became a lawyer, and then I was becoming a rabbi, and it's 1989, so we go from 1978 to, 1980, to 1989, I go back to Israel, and now there are borders, and there are the beginnings of walls dividing communities, and there are, um, and, and many of the Palestinians that I knew had moved into settlements, what are called settlements, which, um, which look like anything from... Um, uh, kind of a, uh, a very run-down, tight little, uh, crowded neighborhood to fairly expansive, somewhat moderately affluent, kind of middle-class kind of neighborhoods, um, but, but isolated from each other and isolated from the people who are living around them. Um, Gaza had been created as a completely separate uh, part of the country in the south that is now isolated from the West Bank, and, um, and all of a sudden you have to get special permission to travel as a Palestinian from one village to another, which may have be where your family is in both places. Um, and, now the, um, and now there are special rules that the Israeli government sets up about where Israelis are allowed to travel in, the, in their own place there. Um, and if you cross over where the dividing line between Israel and um, the West Bank is, you can only go there if you're in the military and you're stationed there. But if you happen to want to go visit the gambling casino that's in um, Jericho, uh, you can't do that anymore because it's now in a part of the Palestinian territory that is no longer considered safe. Um, and we don't want you, the Israeli government doesn't want the Israelis mixing with the Palestinians there. If something were to happen, they would have, uh, it would sort of be like, you're on your own, basically. Um, I grew up in the inner city uh, in Philadelphia, New York, in Miami, in Washington, D.C., um, there were neighborhoods we were told we weren't allowed to go into uh, for our own safety. And it, so it was kind of like that. The, except if I wanted to go into those neighborhoods in New York, I could get on a train and go, and nobody's going to stop me. In, in Israel, if you want to go to one of those neighborhoods, you have to go through a checkpoint. And if you don't have military business there, you get turned back. The other thing that happens if you're an Israeli and you go into the West Bank or you, or you try to go in, and, and if you get in there and something happens to you, like you trip and you sprain your ankle, your insurance is canceled by the Israeli government. 
and so you can't, you're no longer covered by insurance because they want to make sure that you don't go there. And they want to make sure you don't go there partly for safety issues because people do, in very small numbers, uh, get kidnapped. It happens. Very small numbers. In fact, it's safer to be in the Middle East, in Israel or in Palestine, than it is to be in Detroit. But people forget, because all you hear is news media about stuff happening, you're physically safer going to Israel and to the West Bank than you are getting on a train or a plane and going to Detroit, downtown Detroit. So you have to kind of think about what, what we hear and what we know only from a distance, which is very different from being there. The other reason that they don't want them to go is because the less contact you have with your neighbor, the less you know about them, the more that you can be afraid of them, the more that you can not understand them and think and be kind of taught to um, what people want you to know about them rather than who they really are. Because if, like I did in 1978, lived with a Palestinian family for a week, and all of a sudden, they're no longer strangers to me, as a, even this one family. It's very different from um, Israelis who have grown up living across the street from a border wall where they can't see the people on the other side and have never met them and don't know what their life is like because they can't see it. It's a, it is a, um, a, a really... Uh, kind of an amazing shift in culture when you go from this open, easy, I can get into anybody's car, to if you cross this line, we're cutting off your insurance because we don't want you, while you're there, because we don't want you going there. Um, so uh, just a little, uh, so I went, in 1989, I went back a couple became a big brother to uh, a, a young boy whose father was killed in Lebanon in the war between Israel and Lebanon um, in 1981. Um, and his older brother was in the military, so he didn't have to go into the military. Um, but he didn't have a father, and he didn't have a bigger brother because he was in the military. So, they, so he joined the big brother program. So I became his big brother. And this kid was from Kurdistan. He's a Jewish kid from Kurdistan. He speaks Hebrew with an Arabic accent. He taught me how to count. Echad, Shtaim, Shalosh, Arba, Chamsa. And in Hebrew, the, in Hebrew, the number five is Chamesh. And in Arabic, it's Chamsa for, five, for the five fingers on the hand. Chamsa the hand. And so I learned, because he, because he was an Arab Jew, he spoke Arabic and Hebrew kind of mixed together. And he was also dark-skinned, because he was from Yemen. He was a Yemenite. And he, um, and he would tell me uh, in, his, uh, in his Hebrew, and my kind of bad Hebrew, like he would tell me um, about how... Uh, um, Arabs uh, were bad people. And, I, I, and he would call them uh, kushim, which, is, which was uh, blackies in Hebrew, which is equivalent to the N-word in English. Kushim. And so he, um, uh, so he said that. And so I, I said to him, pick up your shirt, like lift it up, show me your belly. And he lifted up his shirt, and I said, what color is your belly? And he looked at it, and I said, what color are Arabs? And he, he's like, oh. Like, he, didn't, he had no clue what he was saying in relationship to himself. But in fact, in Israeli society, in the same way it is here in the United States, the darker your skin, the lower you are on the socioeconomic ladder. So if you're a Jew from Europe, and you're a Jew from Yemen, you have a high, there's a, there is a status issue there. And what do people do when we live in a culture where we have status, where I'm higher than you are? The next level down pushes the one below them, and the one below them pushes the one below them, because nobody wants to be at the bottom. 
And so, um, and so he was taught that, that he wasn't an Arab, he was a Jew, even though he was an Arab Jew, and that he was different from the other people who had the same skin color that he did, even though the white people, the white Jews in the next neighborhood treated him as badly as he was talking about, um, uh, about the, uh, the non-Jewish Arabs, the other people there. So I got to do a little teaching and also a lot of learning from him and his family. And one of the things that his mother uh, and I got to talk about a lot was kind of how to help raise him to be more human and less divisive in that, um, in that, in that uh, piece. And, um, uh, and then I came back to the US after that trip. Um, that was 1993. And I never wanted to go back again. I was, I, I, was, um, I was so turned off by what I experienced about my own people, the Jews, about Israeli society, which I had such great hopes for. I was going to leave my American life and become an Israeli. I, had, I, gave, I, 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 had, I was so torn about this uh, piece of uh, kind of how Israelis were behaving there that I, um, I just didn't ever want to go back again. And then uh, about three years ago, oh, so I was a lawyer and I was a rabbi and then I decided to become a nurse. So I went to nursing school and I became a nurse. And, um, and I have a friend who runs a program in Austin. It's called Circle of Health International. And she sends midwives and nurses and, and OBGYNs um, uh, to uh, refugee and natural disasters to help women who are pregnant, birthing, or have just given birth. And, um, and she said to me, I've never run a trip to the Middle East. Do you want to lead it? And I said, I don't ever want to go back again. And she said, but you could go and you could see it differently and you could help. And so I went back with this group. Um, and I led it. Uh, we had an Egyptian uh, woman on the uh, doctor on the trip. We had um, a South American, a Canadian, and a couple from the United States. We started in Jordan, and we met Palestinians living in Jordan, and we worked with them. And then we went to the West Bank, and we worked with Palestinians living in the West Bank. And then we went to Israel, and we worked with Africans, with Sudanese and Eritreans, who moved to Israel um, to try to make a life outside of Sudan when they were escaping um, uh, murder and persecution in very much the same way Jews did after the Holocaust when we went to America and we went to Israel and uh, to Palestine and we went to South America to get away from um, all the murder. And, um, and I saw, once again, the Israeli uh, population and the Israel, well, the Israeli government treating these African refugees um, in a way that they were taking advantage of them. They, they didn't get citizenship, so they couldn't get health insurance. So they had to pay out of pocket, very much like undocumented people do in the United States. They're not covered. Um, they also, when they, were, when they would get an apartment, the people who were renting them apartments would take advantage of them because they had to pay cash. And they would say, like, you know, this is how much it is. For you guys, it's 10 times as much as it is for somebody else. So they would have to get 10 people living in there in order to make it possible to pay the rent. And then it becomes unhealthy because you've got all those people packed into a small place. So once again, I get frustrated and I think, why am I here? I don't want to come back here again. Um, when I was in the West Bank and I was working in Ramallah in a, in a hospital that was run by Hamas. It's uh, um, one of the groups that uh, people in the West say is the most violent and one of the terrorist organizations. They are also one of the groups that supports all of social services in the West Bank. They, ran, they run one of the most beautiful hospitals in Ramallah and one of the safest places to go if you're sick. So I go in, and I am a white American 
in, in the Hamas-run hospital. And I was with two uh, nurses, two other nurses, one of whom was also Jewish. And, um, and we went in, and the chief, of, the chief nursing officer brought us into his office. And we started to talk. And I realized that it was, it, was, it was safe, it was comfortable, and what he wanted was teaching from us about how to take care of women in this particular place where they were refugees, and there wasn't a lot of money, and there weren't a lot of resources, and they wanted to make sure that the women and that the babies were safe. And that's why we were there. Um, and, uh, and I had an amazing experience there, came into Israel, and then faced this challenge about being Jewish and about being a rabbi and about being in Israel and watching another group of people being uh, kind of outcast and separated, the, the African community that was there in Tel Aviv. And it was horrifying. Um, I got into a cab with uh, the, an Israeli cab driver and he said, why are you here? And I said, I'm doing some volunteer work in a hospital in Ramallah. And he said, um, and, I'm, and I'm working with these people. And he said, well, why are you doing it? And I said, well, because it's the right thing to do. And he said, as an Israeli and as a Jew, I only work to make money to support my family and take care of my kids. Um, uh, I am not trained in, in doing good. I'm glad you're here. And that was a hard thing to hear. That there was nothing in his world of, of religion or spirituality, of Judaism, that taught him to be a good person. It was all about self, taking care of self. And that was a, a fairly um, challenging place to be as well. A year later, um, I went back again, uh, this time uh, on a trip with, uh, it's a dual narrative trip, where on the tour bus, there was a Palestinian and an Israeli tour guide. And every place we went, they would describe what was going on from each of their perspective. What was this place? And, um, and it was a, also a really kind of amazing piece. And one of the things that was also very challenging is that the Israeli had the same challenge as I did, but she was living there and staying there. And she believed she had to be there. So, um, so complicated, the Middle East is, uh, is, a, is like the tiny little way of saying like what's going on there. And understanding uh, what it means to, um, to be religious, spiritual, uh, to be Jewish, to be Palestinian, to be Muslim, to be uh, a, a Christian Palestinian, to be a Christian uh, Israeli, to be a Muslim Israeli. There are all sorts of variations, very complicated. So I want to draw a little kind of a, a little picture. Um, the state of Israel is about the size of Rhode Island. The entire country is about the size of Rhode Island. You know how long it takes to drive from one end of Rhode Island to the other? A couple of hours. And from east to west in Jerusalem, we're talking about an hour and a half. That's it, from one side to the other. And when people talk about um, safety issues and about uh, density, population density, and about what it means to be there, they're talking about a very small piece of land. The land itself now is even smaller because, the, because it's been divided. And so if you imagine a, a diamond cut straight down the middle, and half of the diamond is on the Mediterranean Sea, and the other half is on the other side of the Jordan River, and there's no, it's not touching water anywhere except for the Jordan River. And what you have is half of the diamond is green and lush, and has seaports and beaches and water, fresh water. And the other half of the diamond is dry and arid and completely isolated from, uh, from anything uh, outside. It's landlocked, um, except for touching this river that it doesn't have access to. 
That's the West Bank. And what happened is we had, um, we had a big landmass uh, several hundred years ago. The British, who were famous for running around dividing up land, move into the, the area, um, uh, take over the Ottoman, um, the Ottoman Turks and uh, kind of move them out. And they decide to divide up the land and they, the British at the time were um, very much about alliances. Like who would serve them the best here? And they felt like Israel would be, as a Jewish state, would give them the best opportunity if they supported the Jews. And so when they divided the state in half, they gave the Jewish portion, the part that faces the ocean, because they needed the ports, and they gave the landlocked part, and they made it part of what is now Jordan. So what we have is this land that's divided by outsiders, by the British, creating this, um, these two separate places. And until then, um, the, the Middle East was, a, um, was kind of uh, more broken up by tribal territory and by different family units. And Jordan was given to the Hashemite community, which was actually one of the smallest wealthiest communities there instead of giving it to what people call the Palestinians who were the largest population there but fairly poor. What I put up here is um, something uh, you can all find on the web. It's from uh, WBUR radio station in Boston, uh, a program they have called Point of View, POV. And, um, and what they did was a history of the um, Palestinian-Israeli conflict, and they gave us every point in history as if an Israeli is telling you what happened and as if a Palestinian is telling you what happened. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing. It's 10 pages of history here. But I just want to show you. So in 1917, the Brit British government and the Balfour Declaration... Um, uh, made the partition in the land and from the Palestinian perspective there were ex an exchange of letters became known as the Hussein McMahon correspondence and this was the dividing of the place in 1918 as a result of World War I Britain wins control over the area over the Ottomans in 1921 Britain gives the area of British mandate Palestine east of the river to the Hashemite kingdom of Transjordan. So all of a sudden in 1921, we have a new country, Transjordan. It didn't exist before. The people were always there, but it wasn't a country in this way. And in the land of um, Palestine, that is, um, on the west side of the river where the Mediterranean Sea is, there was, there was a lot of um, back and forth fighting between the Jews and the Arabs there, the Pal Jews and the Palestinians, and the Jews called it pogroms, which is the word that we used when we talked about the murder that was happening in Europe, and the Palestinians called it a revolt. And it was a revolt as much against the British as it was against Jews. In 1947, the General Assembly of the UN recommends a partition of the British Mandate into two states, one for Jews and one for Arabs. Now remember, the Jews who are living there are Arabs. This is, um, this is a, a, a new kind of concept that Jews were different from Arabs, being created by the British and by the Jews that were living there. But in truth, they were all from the, Arab, uh, the Arabian Peninsula, at least many of them were. Zionist leaders accepted the proposed partition because they got what they wanted. The Zionists or the Israelis. Palestinians 
consider the proposal unrepresentative of the demographic distribution of Jews and Arabs at the time, and so they rejected it. Yes. Sorry. And your name is? Steve. Steve. Uh, Rabbi, so is that the definition between a Arab and a Jewish person? The definition is that which there, one makes what? I guess is what. There, I'm there to is say. no uh, back to the right. Bible bias and bullshit. Um, <laughs> the the distinctions are made by people who want to make the distinctions. So, for example, my my um, Kurdi uh, little brother and his family, they recognize themselves as Kurds as Arabs and as, uh, and as Jews. And now they're Israelis also, right? So it's a, it's a complicated piece. Um, you've got Palestinians living in Israel who have citizenship in Israel, who call themselves Palestinians with Israeli citizenship. And you have Palestinians living in Israel who call themselves Israelis. And you have Israeli Palestinians and Palestinian Israelis. And it's, it's hard. In, in, when I was growing up in the U.S., uh, so I'm 55, um, when I was a kid and Israel had become a state in 1948, um, I was born in 62, one of the questions they would always ask us every year in religious school was, are you a Jewish American or an American Jew? And people at the time, start, like we had never really had that question before. And in the Middle East, they have that question. They've had that question at the same, for the same amount of time. Where is your allegiance? How do you identify yourself? And what do other people call you? When I travel in, when I, tra when I leave the United States, I'm an American because that's what's stamped in my passport. And, and, uh, and so it's, a, it's an interesting piece, like who defines who we are? And, and uh, it's a good question. Sure. In 1948, so we have this, um, we have Israel becoming a state. The Israelis call it Melchemet uh, Ha'atzma'ut, the War of Independence. Right? This is the 4th of July in Israel. And the Palestinians call it Al-Nakba, the catastrophe, the destruction. It's all about perspective. Right? Where, are you, where are you in this situation when, when it happens to you? It is, it's one of the challenges living in North America that we have also because we sometimes only look at our own perspective. Like, what is this doing to us? But had we ever lived with people in the places that we're at war with, and saw the world from their perspective, what would it look like to them? When we go into uh, Iraq and we call it liberation, and the Iraqis call it destruction, and we don't understand why they don't love us for it, it's important to see what their neighborhoods look like now, and what their water systems, and their phone systems, and their electronics, and their, their electrical grids, and um, and, and all of how their life has been disrupted by the liberation. Perspectives are very um, unique to the people and the bias of the ones who want to tell the story. And I think one of the beautiful things about this point of view is that it puts them side by side. In uh, 1967, Israelis call this the Six Day War. Um, there was a preemptive attack against Egypt, uh, against Egypt and gains control over the territory formerly controlled by Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. And now we're talking about Israel taking possession of the West Bank and Gaza. Now, one of the um, one of the things that Israel didn't do in in uh, in this time period was annex the West Bank and make it Israel. Like if we. Um, it's kind of like, it's a little like Puerto Rico. Like, it's kind of the U.S., but not really. There's kind of a separate government, but we're still tied to each other. And so the West Bank is sort of controlled by Israel, but it's not really Israel. And so it becomes a, a highly problematic piece. 
If you're trying to control something, but you don't claim it as yours, there's going to be a problem. Had Israel annexed the West Bank, the problem would be very different because everybody living in there would be Israelis, and Israel would have to face, now what are we going to do with this population that is all us? But by keeping it separate, now it's like they're occupiers. Israel is occupying the West Bank, not owning it by their own choice at that point. Over the 40 years between then and now, what happens is you get culture growing up generation after generation who are living under occupation. And Israel is a, t is a new state. I'm not old enough to be, have been there when Israel was born, but my aunt was as a state, it's a, as a country. It's a brand new thing. The United States is not that old. It's only 200 years old. But you can see how far we've gotten from the occupation of native land to feeling like we are not, this is now ours. And the natives who were here before us are now on reservations or they've assimilated, they've melded into the rest of society but it's not like it was, it's, it's so far removed, even in 200 years, that we talk about it very differently. But in a way, that's really what we're talking about here, in a way, that this was a land that belonged to other people, became occupied, and it's still in that infancy of, like, it hasn't been long enough to feel like this is how it's going to be forever. Kind of one of the weird things is that the only casino in Israel in, is, is actually in the West Bank and it's Palestinian run. In very much the same way the casinos, many of the casinos in the United States are on native land and are run by Native Americans, owned and run. Anybody have an idea of why that might be? Why wouldn't we want casinos to be, to belong to the United States? Why would we want to see them as separate from us, even though we're going to go to them? So for, for tax purposes, so the money is laundered in a way through other entities, right? It's a big money maker. Why else politically or socially would we want that? How does America define itself religiously? Hmm? Protestant, as a Christian country, in a lot of ways. Liberal Christian, conservative Christian, secular Christian, but still Christian. Are gambling casinos allowed in Christian places? Mm -mm. Give it to the natives, put it on their land, let them run it for us, and they own it. It's not ours. It's not, it doesn't dirty our hands. But we'll use it, and we'll profit from it, but we don't want to own it. We have um, the Israelis referring to 19, the war in 1973 as the Yom Kippur War, which is the Jewish Day of Atonement. Palestinian Arabs call it the War of Ramadan. Two different religious holidays, both involve fasting for self-reflection, and we have a war during that time and, and, uh, and identified in two different ways. This, um, let's see. Some really, uh, some really uh, kind of powerful um, Challenges like it's and it's so funny because we have we really do we're going through a lot of the same stuff here. We have uprisings by people who are oppressed, and they get identified in the newspaper. It's like why don't these people know we're giving them something good? Why aren't they don't understand that they live in America and this is a good thing? And why would they want to rise up against us 
It's the same conversation that happens in the Middle East around the Israelis and the Palestinians. Why, why don't they just see that they would have a much worse life if it wasn't for us? However, we don't give them money for schools. We don't pick up their garbage as often as we pick up our own. The water that they're drinking is inferior to ours because we don't clean the systems the way we do. They're, they're, it, it's a, um, we don't police their neighborhoods, although they're not allowed to police them themselves. It's a, it, it's a very um, uh, interesting struggle. What we start to notice is that once was, what once was the Middle East is now very Western, dealing with a lot of the same stuff that we deal with here. And, and you, you're free to have whatever perspective you want about it. It's just, I think it's interesting to see the parallels when you look so far away and if you hear of something there and you have a judgment about it, to think about what, what are we doing here as well? Like, what does it look like here? And vice versa. If you do or don't like something that's happening here, how do you view how it's happening somewhere else? I have a, um, a pretty, uh, I have a challenging um, perspective on Israel as, some, as a Jew. Um, I have a challenging perspective on Israel as an American, and I have a challenging um, perspective on Israel uh, anyway, as a human being, I think. One of the challenges living in the United States about looking at, as, at Israel is because as a Christian country, identified as Christian country, Israel is important. It's important biblically to both Christians and Jews, the Hebrew Bible. There is nowhere in the Hebrew Bible that the state of Israel is given to the Jews. Nowhere in there. It's a later overlay. And I want to I be clear, because I've, I've studied that my whole life. It's my book. And, I, and, it, and it is, there is nowhere in there. And in fact, the book says that the only time Israel as a place can be established is after the Messiah comes. And so what we have now is a political nation living in the Middle East who calls itself Israel, but there are the most pious, the most religious Jews on the planet do not um, recognize Israel as a state. Liberal Jews, conservative Jews, understand Israel as a state. But the most religious, most uh, intense Jewish community says Israel has not been created yet because the Messiah is not here yet. Because for the Jewish world, the Messiah comes once, hasn't come yet. And when the Messiah comes, Israel will be free and there won't be any trouble. And, um, uh, and that hasn't happened yet. So, uh, the, so it's not possible. The people of Israel will be free and safe. And that's not possible yet. So there are Jews living in what we call Israel who don't recognize the state of Israel and don't have to fight in the military because they're not, they don't see themselves as being citizens of the country because they don't live in a country that exists. It's very complicated. And then you have um, an American uh, uh, fundamentalist Christian uh, leaning that believes, that some of whom believe that in order for the Messiah to come back, for Jesus to return, all of the Jews have to either become Christians or go to Israel so that the final war can be fought and, um, and then the Messiah can show up again. And so Israel's necessary for fundamentalist Christianity for it to be Jewish, because if it's not Jewish, then Jews can't go back there. And so, uh, and it's an interesting place to be as a Jew, because I live in a country where there are people who wish me lovingly to death. Right? 
go back there so that you can be beaten so that the Messiah can come and we support Israel. It's, a, it's very complicated. A lot of the money that goes into building settlements in the West Bank comes from North America. And these Israeli settlements, that are Jewish settlements that are being built in the West Bank are mostly religious Jews, very religious, but not the fanatical religious, the ones who don't consider Israel a state. They believe that by going into the West Bank and filling it up with Jews, that eventually it will have to become part of Israel. And Israel will be united and the West Bank will be annexed and no longer occupied. And so illegal settlements are being built. Illegal not by the Western world's views of what Israel should do, but by Israeli law. They're illegal. And the Israeli government supports them, even though the law in the book says they can't build them. And they build settlements. And in these settlements go these very uh, religious Jews, mostly. And... Um, and they're, they're, they're in that land there making more of a divide between Palestinian villages. In some of the... Um, this is one of the challenges of segregated communities. It's true in the United States, too. If you separate yourselves... If we separate ourselves from those living in poverty by wealth, right? If we say this is going to be a wealthy neighborhood and the poor people live over there... Where are most of the police officers in the wealthy community, and why? Well, they have to protect them, right? I mean, there is, if you take, if you take away and you put it all in one, if you put all the money in a pot and people don't have access to it, you have to protect it. So it's a funny thing, though. The more we segregate ourselves, the more we end up having to spend on police force. If we integrate, we have a different, we, we, we live in a different way. The police force is l like, le has to protect less, protects everybody equally in that space, and you need less of them. In the Middle East, when you go into one of the settlements, there's almost one officer for every family. So the, the money that's being spent in Israel on police force are, is in illegal settlements. The majority of it is in illegal settlements that, that need to be protected from the people around them because they're in a place where they shouldn't be. It's very complicated. And then you have to get those people to their jobs in Israel on roads that are protected. And because you build a road between two places that goes between them, if some people live up here and some people live down here, they have to drive all the way around to get there because they're not allowed to cross that road. It's, a, it's very complicated. Everything that, gets, that happens, and remember, we're talking about the state of Rhode Island. It's tight. In your science classes, you learn that you turn up the heat, right? The molecules start bouncing off of each other faster. That's what creates the boil and the eruption into steam. You put a lot of people in tight spaces. You crowd them in. You make it harder and harder to move, and they start bouncing off of each other harder, whether they want to or not. It's why you don't like to sit so close to the people next to you. Imagine all of you crowded into four tables. How that would feel. Just even if you like each other. If you don't have any personal space. Imagine yourself in a, um, in a uh, refugee center where your whole family is living in a one-bedroom apartment, two or three generations, and there's another family above you and another family below you, and there are others on either side of you. No matter how much you want to be a human being, it is very complicated. When I was in uh, Israel the last time, um, and I was, when I went into the West Bank, I was standing on the roof of the hospital in Ramallah, and I was looking at an Israeli settlement, an illegal settlement, and I was looking at a Palestinian uh, refugee camp. 
the, there were a couple of differences. One was that the Israeli settlement had barbed wire all the way around it, razor ribbon, that the lawns were green, and that the roofs were just roof shingles. And you look in the Palestinian refugee camp, the houses were pretty much the same size. There were no walls, no fences, there was no grass, and on the roof of every house was a big black plastic cistern that held a thousand gallons. When I turned around on the roof of the hospital, I noticed that they had the same cisterns, these big water tanks on the roof. And I asked him what they were for, the chief of uh, nursing there. And he said, well, in the West Bank, the Israelis control the water, so we get water once a week. The tap gets turned on once a week to the town, and everybody fills their cisterns, and for the rest of the week, you drink the water that comes out of this plastic tank. The settlement right there has water every day because it's Israel proper. So the same water supply gets shut off in this neighborhood six days a week and is running seven days a week over here. And you know it because you can see it in the way that the people have to live. And the hospital has to store water for those seven days, six days. If somebody, um, if the Israelis are worried about an uprising at one of the checkpoints um, at any point uh, in, in the week, the water might stay off for another week. So the reason they don't have grass is not because they can't grow it with the water in the tank, but because if they use all the water up in that week, it may not get turned on again for another week. It's very challenging. It's not so clear. So there's all, the, like, there's all of that negativity that I bring with me as a Jew and an American and an as American Jew and uh, as somebody who wanted to become an Israeli when I was a kid and who lived there for a while, year, you know, for a couple of years over my lifetime so far. And then I was also raised with this history of uh, kind of a, an innate hatred or fear of or jealousy of Jews uh, in the West. And, uh, and I was taught as the child of children of gr my grandparents' generation who are Holocaust survivors, although my family had been in the U.S. during the Holocaust, that there was nowhere safe for Jews in the world and that if Israel hadn't been created, that we would probably be destroyed now. And so there's also this piece, and every culture has it about its own place. If we don't have a place on the planet, then, then we're not safe anywhere. It's why people put locks on their doors. This is my safe place. Now, I might feel like I need to lock it for it to be safe, but this is mine. I own this, or I rent this. It's mine. I'm going to lock people out. And after six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust, which was half of the Jewish population at the time in Europe, after six million Jews are killed in the Holocaust, The only land we know is a biblical story. This, this promised land in the Middle East with the Mediterranean on one side and the Jordan River dro uh, going down the middle. We have this ancient story. We, that's where we'll be safe. And so that's where we're going to go. And so you have a country that's founded in 1948 out of Holocaust survivors. People who lost their entire families, their children, their spouses, their parents, their siblings. The founders of the state of Israel were the survivors of the Holocaust. And so you can see why all of the uh, conversation that we hear, that we read about, about security and safety, 
why that conversation is a real conversation regardless of what's going on there. It's a historical conversation. If any of your families came from places where you came here because, because the land that they were living on wasn't safe, there's always going to be a pull to go back. And many, many generations down the road, the pull may get weaker and weaker, but it's always going to be there and it's always going to be in the stories. Our story of the land is 2,000 years old. And there were Jews who lived there all that time. A small number of Arab Jews who lived in the Middle East all that time. But the majority of the Jewish world that went to create the state were Holocaust survivors. That story is a story that most North Americans understand from our own family experiences, Jewish or otherwise. All of your families that came here are likely families that have left some sort of exile because of danger and have longed for home, creating home. And so that biblical story is one that like people hang on to really tightly, even though it's not true, because it's not actually the story that's in the Bible. It's the way it's been told, but it's not written that way, not in the Hebrew. But there's some like need that we have because this is what we've experienced that we all want to go we, we want to have that place. And the Jews feel like we got that chance. One of the things that we say post-Holocaust as Jews is um, never again. Always remember and never again. Always remember the Holocaust. We're now uh, um, 70 years away. We're three and a half generations away from the Holocaust. It is much harder to remember and not forget what the Holocaust did because we're so far removed from it, even though it's only 70 years ago. We keep telling the story over and over again. And, and every culture has the same piece. Uh, the Dalai Lama goes to, the, to um, Jewish leaders outside of Israel to ask questions about how do you live in exile for so long, for 2,000 years, because the Tibetans are now out of China. The Dalai Lama is not allowed to go back, and his people can't go back. And so the question is, how do you survive as a people? Because we've had that experience, but now we have a country, and so maybe they're hoping also to have a country to go back to at some point. How do you live in exile? It's complicated. I, um, I, I want to stop for a bit because I, uh, I can talk for hours and hours. I, I'm a lawyer and I'm a rabbi and I have been a professor and I know how to talk. I could talk for three, four, five hours. I don't have to drink anything or eat anything. I can just <laughs> keep going straight through. The president of our temple came tonight, and she knows that. That's, that's a, yeah, she, see? <laughs> so I'm going to stop for a couple of minutes, and I just want you to, like, sit. And, and then, if you have any questions, let them come up. Or thoughts. Your name is? Oh, my name is Gavin. Gavin? Gavin. Gavin. So yeah, I just wanted to, I'm sorry, I'm not used to speaking on mics. I just wanted to thank you for taking your time to speak to all of us. But um, it seems to me that the underlining issue behind this contention is each other's side's inability to recognize the other's historical narrative. And considering that past peace talks, such as like the, the Camp David summit in 2000, were such a failure in which um, the negotiations between the Israels and Palestinians um, were like magnanimous at best, where the Israel's negotiations were to set up things like radars dishes in Palestine, the complete demilitarization of Palestine, uh, water management in the West Banks, 
And uh, considering that a modern two-state solution would require um, Israel to uproot its settlements in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, and considering that past peace talks, that was off the table, do you believe that a modern two-state solution is possible? And if so, how? Um, so personally, absolutely not. I don't believe that a two-state solution is possible. Um, I think that the, uh, it, would, it would require everybody and all the Jews in the West Bank to pick up and move, as you said. Um, and, uh, and I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, so, so what I hope for is a one-state solution that becomes democratic and that, uh, and that however the numbers play out over time in terms of population growth, uh, that the country is able to run as a democratic nation. The, one, the other, one of the pieces, thanks for the question, um, one of the pieces about um, why Israel never annexed the West Bank is because the Palestinian population there is large. And, and the Israeli Jewish population is large, but not growing as fast. Jews in uh, North America and in Israel have on average about one and a half to two children per family. You can't grow a generation. The next generation, statistically, you need 2.4 children per household to have a next generation that's, that's the same size as the generation now. You have to have three kids. Every family in your community needs to have three kids in order just to recreate the same number of people in the last generation, and that's because of death and because some people won't reproduce again, and because people move away. And so you have to have three kids. So if you're only having two children for every Jewish family, and the Palestinians are having three or more, eventually, if Israel annexes the West Bank, there will be more, Palestinian, more Palestinians than Israelis in Israel. And if you're a democratic population that doesn't move boundaries around who gets to vote, then you, then, uh, then you recognize that if you have more Palestinians than Israelis, that the country now has, is a Palestinian country with an Israeli minority. And in order to keep that from happening, you have to keep pushing out Palestinian numbers in order to keep the Jewish numbers high. It used to be that what would happen is that the Jewish community in Israel would try to entice Jews from around the world to move to Israel. If we're not going to grow by families having babies, let's grow by bringing all of the American Jews to Israel. And if you move here, we'll have another 13 million people. But we don't want to leave here. We don't want to go there. And so it's a, a, it never happened. And so there's that challenge. Any other questions or thoughts? Um, I don't understand the... And your, your name? I'm Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Hi. Um, I don't understand what a Jew, Jewish and Arab, how they're different. So it's hard to understand Israeli, Palestinian, Jewish, yeah. Arab. What, and then what do they look like? Are they um, dark-skinned? Or, yeah. Um, are, do they look like you? Are you either? You're a rabbi. Yeah. No, it's good. It's good question. Okay. This is part of. Thanks. Are you? Where are you from? I'm a Texan. You're a Texan. Fine Texan. <laughs> um, uh, you don't have to be that strong about it because we're actually in Texas and you're surrounded by Texans. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That's you weren't here for my talk about how I'm sarcastic all the time and I don't mean it personally. Sorry. Okay. Um, the uh, uh, it's a great question. So. Um, and, it, and it plays off of the earlier um, qu question. Yeah. So, um, so, and I don't even know if I can give you an answer. So th here's how it goes. Um, when uh, there, were, there were 12 tribes in the biblical story about uh, who moved into Canaan, and it became a country of, Jew of Israelites. And it didn't actually become a country of Israelites because Israel was one of the families. Judah was the other. 
So what happened was, um, uh, so, so, the, the, so what became Judea, the, like Judaism comes from the tribe of Judah, and Israel comes from the Is- Israelites, the rest of the tribes. And, um, and what happened was Judea sort of got m- merged into Judah, into Israel. And so this is an ancient story. And so what we end up having is um, a population called Israelites, but not Israelis. Okay. So we have a biblical people who have an identity and a relationship with their concept of God that morphs over time throughout history. What, um, what happens is the, the religious element to this people ties themselves back to, the, to Judah and becomes the Jews. So we identify as Jews and not as Israelis or Israelites. When trying to establish a state in the Middle East, the question is, what are you going to call it? And because Israelite was the last state, it becomes Israel. And so instead of being called Judah, right, with the state of of Judah. So we have Jews who can be Israelis if they grew up there and live there. Or we can have Jews that are American because I was born here. So I'm not an Israeli. So my family is European. And when I did the 23andMe genetic test, I am 99.5% European uh, Ashkenazi, which means European Jew, German Jew. Like, that's Germanic Jewish. I don't have, I almost have no Middle Eastern blood in my body. (laughs) So this is what a Jew who comes from European stock looks like. But um, uh, let's pick on somebody else just by face. So, so, and you're from where? Your family? Iran. Iran. So this person sitting right here, who happens to be (laughs) Iranian, could be Jewish because there are Jews in Iran. And if she was Jewish and she was Iranian, she would look like this and be Jewish. Right? Here's me standing with her behind her and her face there. Right? And if you come up, come over here. I know you two like each other, so you can stand by. And why don't you sit, sit right there. Just. And you're from where? I'm half European, half Egyptian. Oh, so now we've got a different combination, right? And there are different facial features that we have as Europeans than Egyptians. Got a, you've got a mixture of that in your, in, in your structure. So a Jew who had a European parent and an Egyptian parent might look like him. Right? It's complicated. A, a Jew from Ethiopia is going to be very dark-skinned. Ethiopian Africans are very dark-skinned. And so the Jews from Ethiopia um, are, are, are completely dark brown, like completely dark brown. And you would not, no Jew from Europe would be able to identify that person as Jewish unless they were wearing, uh, you know, a hat that said, I'm Jewish and, and like we, we come from the same religion. It's, so that's hard. Jews who are born in Saudi Arabia are Arabs on the Arabian Peninsula. They're, Sa- they're Saudis and they will look like Saudis which is a combination of people from all over, too. So it's, um, it's tricky. So I'm Jewish by religion. I'm American by birth. I'm European by des- uh, descent. And so I have all that thing, all that stuff. And so that's why it's hard to say. The same thing is true about um, Muslims, but it's also tr- but a Palestinian is somebody who was born in, an, in the Palestinian uh, area, which is from the Mediterranean to the end of Jordan to Syria, part of Saudi Arabia, uh, a little bit of Lebanon. Like there is a large area in the Middle East that was where where Palestinians have been living for a long time. And they they tend to look more like each other in that origin without without intermarriage because they all came, they're, they're identified from a similar 
place on the planet. But there are Palestinian Jews, right? Because they're not, it's not that they're Muslims or Christians. There are Palestinian Jews. So I might, if I was a Palestinian Jew and I'm standing next to a Palestinian Christian or a Muslim, we all may look exactly alike genetically, but our religions are different. So, yeah. And then you come to the United States and you can convert to Judaism and you can convert to Christianity and you can convert to Islam, but you can't convert to being a Palestinian because that's a nationality. So you can have Muslims who look like me, right? And you can have Jews who, who, you, who come from Muslim countries who converted to Judaism or Christians who look like who come, came from other countries that didn't have Christianity. It's very complicated. And you get, um, and then you add in the Asian profile <laughs> and you get a whole nother set of mixes. One of, uh, one of the most beautiful things, if you go to, um, to, into Israel and to uh, Palestine and you look at the people, what you will see are red-headed, dark-skinned, green-eyed people which you don't get in most places in the world. Because there, if you're, a Jew from, uh, if you're a Jew from Ireland and you marry a Jew from Yemen, you might have a dark-skinned child with red hair and green eyes. And, they're all, and everybody in the family was Jewish. So, it's, uh, so that's there too. Yes? And your name? Cole. Cole. Um, so earlier you were talking about how the extremely religious Jewish people in Israel, they don't have to be a part of the military. Are there people that don't identify with that, that pretend like they are so that they don't have to participate in the military? Yeah, so you, um, th there are ways of getting out of the military. You could have a psych, uh, psych evaluation that says you're not fit to serve. Um, you could have a medical problem, like in the United States, that you know you're not fit to serve. Um, it would be dangerous for you to be in the military, to yourself or to somebody else. Um, uh, but but in order to be an ultra orthodox Jew, you have to be willing to live in that community and abide by their rules. So, I would say military service is easier than um, than living in that community, um, and it's. Uh, uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't know that anybody would want to pretend that because you really would have to become part of that community and you can't actually, it's not easy to get in. Like they're very, they're very much their own family lines and they're very protective, um, insular, they know each other. Uh, so you can't just kind of identify yourself as, hey, I'm ultra-Orthodox and I, but I live over here, you know, in this suburb. Um, you would have to have grown up in that community or at least lived there long enough and been one of them. And they would have married you to somebody. They do arrange marriages. So, you, you know, you have to make that choice instead of going into the military. Yeah. Yes? And your name? Emma. Emma. Okay. <laughs> um, so I grew up in a neighborhood in New Jersey that was extremely Jewish and um, a lot of Orthodox families. I never quite understood the difference between Hasidic Jew and Orthodox Jew there. Um, so I just wanted to Where, know. What town were you from? Uh, Ocean Township, New Jersey. Sure. So it's like Deal and yep. yeah. So there are, um, so uh, it's a, so what happened was, um, before the Holocaust, the Jews of Europe were identified by the town that they lived in. So if you lived in the town of Lubavitch, you were a Lubavitcher Jew. And if you lived in the town of um, Minsk, you were a Minsk Jew. And you identified your religion with the rabbis, the teachers in your community. And your community and this Jewish community were very different. After the Holocaust, most of those uh, uh, rural Jewish communities in Europe were wiped out in the Holocaust. The urban Jews, some of them got out, 
That's why we have a lot of German Jews in the United States, um, because the, the Berliners who got out before, uh, before they were put into camps or, or uh, couldn't leave. Um, but the poor Jews in the countryside, the, the, um, the West Texas Jews, they, they were the ones who were massacred, mostly. A couple of those communities, their rabbis survived, and a couple of the members of the community survived. And they came mostly to the United States. Some of them went to Israel. Um, and they set up shop here and started populating their, repopulating their communities to, to repopulate the six million that were killed during the Holocaust. And New Jersey, New York um, were part of where that was because there were already some Jews living there. And, uh, and so what you get in those towns are these isolated Jewish communities that follow their rabbi and they're ultra-Orthodox, meaning that they're ultra-protective. They're like, like, if there's a military, our military is not very strict compared to some militaries in the, in the world. They were, they're like those militaries. Like they make the, Jew, the Orthodox Jews look like they're um, not practicing. <laughs> they live in, a, in closed communities. They only marry within their communities. They don't work on the, the Jewish Sabbath. They don't have jobs outside of the Jewish community. They don't interact with television beyond their community. They, they are um, very isolated. The Orthodox Jews who live nearby dress a little more like everybody else around them. They don't wear the clothing of the town they came from in Europe. They wear modern clothes, but maybe dark, black suits and dark dresses. They cover themselves down to the women, to their wrists and to their neck and their ankles, um, but they, out of modesty, but they will go into regular grocery stores as long as they have food there that's kosher, that they can eat. And, um, and they'll participate more in the world. So you would know the difference because the ultra-Orthodox Jews, you mostly see with them each other, and you're, you have to move through them to get into them. And the Orthodox Jews are more like me, who you would see at a university, you know, and they, they're still very religious and traditional, but, um, but they're willing to engage with the rest of the Western world. Yeah. Anyone else? I, I wanna ask. Yeah. I want to ask a question. And it's, and it's hard, because that's where I want to go. <laughs> so the creation of Israel was not like a mutual exchange. It wasn't like the Palestinians happily abandoned 500 villages and right. gave the land over. Right. <clears throat> and then the situation for most Palestinians is either they're, they're completely out of Palestine and Israel or they're confined to the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, which are both basically giant concentration camps at this point, uh, especially the Gaza Strip. So, and and it's just assumed this will never be corrected, right? Because we have UNRWA, the United Nations Work and Refugee Agency, which is just for Palestinians. It doesn't, nobody else is covered by UNRWA except Palestinians. And the assumption is that because it'll never be resolved, UNRWA will exist forever. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course, UNRWA has a really weird rule, which probably shouldn't even bring up, but I want to, and it is that the only people who count as Palestinians according to UNRWA are people who are born to a Palestinian man. So if you're born to a Palestinian woman, you're somehow, and, and the, your father wasn't Palestinian, you're somehow magically not Palestinian anymore. Um, but having said all this, so Palestinians don't have a state, they don't have normal rights of a human being, they've lost their land, they can't expect to get jobs because the unemployment rate's catastrophic, the Gaza Strip is walled off, hemmed in, can't really trade with the outside world. The way they get cars is they smuggle them through tunnels. Um, Egypt works with Israel to blockade them. I don't know how a person can think that this is okay if, without going to a, the next step and saying Palestinians are just simply subhuman and don't, have, don't need rights because they're not really truly human. But I'm sure that can't be that simplistic. That just feels, there's, 
surely there is this piece I'm missing where the, the person goes, yeah, they are human, but I just don't care. I, I don't know. I don't, I'm missing an ingredient here, and I was hoping you could tease it out for me. Yeah, so, um, so everything that you said, as, so as a Jew who grew up in a world where Jews are supposed to love Israel, everything you said resonates with me as 100% accurate, which, is, uh, um, which I have to say, like, so you, you call it hard, but I actually have to live it as a Jew who is tied to Israel, like, in, in, a, in a historical context, like, it, it's really hard. So, um, but there's something I know about the Israelis who are living there. So there was a time very uh, recently, like when I was in there in the 70s, where Palestinians were not seen as the enemy and not seen as subhuman. And, and, and it wasn't, um, and there wasn't a, the problem hadn't developed yet to a point where it was becoming un, uh, unresolvable. And, and then what happened was a wall was built and the Jews who live in Israel stopped seeing what was happening on the other side of the wall. So in much the same way, the jurors who decided that OJ wasn't guilty never saw the media, they weren't allowed to, that the rest of the world saw about what happened and who would have convicted him. The Jews living in Israel have never seen what's going on in Gaza or what's going on on the other side of the wall in Bethlehem or in Nablus or in the rest of the West Bank. On some level, they don't want to know because if they know, they have to do something about it. So they've, they've isolated themselves in a bubble to be able to live their lives there without knowing what they're doing to these other people. And, and what we find is anybody who, any Israeli who goes into the West Bank or into Gaza as a military person comes back brutalized internally. That the PTSD from having to treat people the way that they're taught to treat people and what they have to see while they're there as the way the Palestinians are living in these quasi-concentration camps that they are managing and, and running brutalizes them. And so one of the things you can know is that organizations like um, Combatants for Peace comes out of Palestinians who used to throw... Uh, rocks at Israeli settlers and were thrown into jail. An Israeli military who had to serve in the West Bank who both decided we can't function this way anymore and we have to work together to figure out. And they're the ones who can figure it out. Like they're the only ones, I think, who can figure it out. I think the, um, in the West, we, we are a people, Westerners are people who believe that there are subhumans. Like we, 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 we started it with, we were, we were willing to participate in slavery because we believe in, subhu, in the concept of subhumans. And so it's not such a challenge for Westerners to put the Palestinians in a place in their consciousness that says it's possible that they're not worth the same thing that the Israelis are worth. And it's, it's not a, um, it's not a, it's, I wish it would go away. Like I wish we would open the, crack this open. But it just, it just, I, like, it just doesn't make, it doesn't make sense to me that anybody who, engages with this could stay. The problem is, you, like when you engage with stuff that's really difficult, you, do, you usually do one of two things. You become a radical um, fighter against it, or you completely shut it down because you can't live knowing it. 
it's the same kind of stuff with um, like the child labor stuff that goes on in Asia where we buy clothing that says made in China and we have children in camps that are making our clothes that we want to buy cheaply, but we don't want to know it. So don't show me. It's the same, it's the same, um, remember I'm a, a preacher, so I, like, I, I go into sermon mode. But, um, but it's, it's the same, it's the same, um, it's the same instinct in us that keeps us from paying attention to slaughterhouses for the cattle and the goats and the sheep and the pigs that we eat because we'd rather, as long as it's clean and processed, and I don't have to see what happens over there, it's not a part of my, I don't have to pay attention to it. If I look at it, I either have to become a radical vegetarian and go like spray paint fur coats, you know, so that they can never be worn and like, and or, or I completely shut it down and I don't care where my meat comes from. And I, I'm, I, have, I have a God-given right to eat at McDonald's. Even though they buy all their meat from those packing houses. Or like, or I, you know, I'm, I want fresh fruit from every part of the United States, which is all picked by migrant workers, but I don't want to know that because it, if I know that, then I have to treat the people who made, who, who made it possible for me to have oranges in the winter time or, or apples in the, in the summer, like who made it possible for that, I'd have to think about them differently. So I completely isolate them and I either think of them as less than or I don't want to think about them at all or, better yet, I'll push them away and imagine I don't need them. Like, send them away, because we can live without them. Now, we haven't been living without them for, you know, and I know it's going to happen to the cherry crop or the apple crop if they're gone, but, but, but like, the, we, we, we don't, we can't engage at that level. It is, that is, like, at the crux of the matter. We would need so much therapy to handle, if you open it up about the Palestinians, you have to open it up about Mexicans, you have to open it up about African Americans, you have to open it up about, uh, uh, about cattle, you have to open it up about everything that we do that, that allows us to behave. You have to open it up about women. You have to open it up and say, we treat women as subhuman, we pay them less, we subjugate them, we isolate them, we, like, we have to be, we have to own all this stuff and it is going to take a lot of therapy to get past it. So start now. <laughs> Hi. Hi. And your name? I'm Mocha. Hi, I'm Mocha. Hi. Hi. Um, just another point to add to what you're saying about why we're able to continue the subhuman treatment and not um, just allow it to happen um, in my work with on the Middle East and, and it, it, speaking with Israelis who are on the left, not radicalized, but on the left, I hear a lot about, you know, I understand that Palestinians are occupied right next to me 10 minutes away, but there's, what can I do? I vote, you know, um, I vote, I, get, I, I, I vote. I don't vote for Bibi Netanyahu, I vote for the other person. Uh, and then it's as if they've done their part because they vote and it makes democracy the problem, right? It makes democracy one big paper tiger if you can put all of your personal responsibility onto that one day you go to the voting booth and select someone. Um, I think it allows people to not see their everyday responsibility to be a part of uh, to understand that if you're benefiting from the system, you're perpetuating the system. Yeah, it's, thank you, first of all, for letting me breathe for a minute, and also... I and, know you're and, getting worked up. And for the work, and the work that you do with your art, uh, um, to, you know, in the, like, I do a lot of talking about what's going on in the Middle East, and you've got an artist here who takes photographs and expresses the, the picture, like in pictures, and some people relate 
better to film to pictures than they do to words. And so part of it, I think, is uh, uh, like part of it, uh, along with voting, because you can't not vote, otherwise nothing will change. But you also have to, um, you, have to, you have to put your perspective out there in a way that's real and tangible, and you can, talk, and you can engage with it. Um, the, uh, uh, yeah, um, there is a beautiful, if you, if you want to Google um, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian Women's March, there was a recent um, march against occupation uh, in, in the Middle East, and it, it was a group of Israelis and Palestinian women who got together, 400,000, I think, is that many, who marched together, something, it was some enormous number, 40,000, 400, I don't remember, but it, like, it looked like a sea of people coming, walking together. Um, and there are people who do, who do understand that you have to be able to stand next to somebody and engage with them. And even if they are 10 feet away with a wall between you, there's still a wall there. And you gotta figure out a way to touch each other, to hug each other, to walk with each other, to stare in each other's eyes, or, or nothing, or it doesn't, you don't get that connection. And the moment you get that connection, you, you can't behave the same way anymore. That's, I think that's really true. Yes, and you are? Marin. Marin. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned earlier that you think that the solution would be a singular democratic state, but like you just said, even if those walls were to come down, do you think that there's still gonna be resentment there between the two groups, and would that even solve anything or would it just become a bunch of internal conflict? You know, it's, it's a great, that, it's so great because we, um, when you're living in, uh, in a tumultuous moment, it's painful and ugly and hard. The, the, the way you know whether it was valuable is four generations from now look back and see where they are later. And so I think part of the challenge is I, I might have to do something that is, uh, well, so as a nurse, like for example, if you have a wound that isn't healing, I might have to rip it open to clean it out so that it can eventually heal. And I may no longer be your nurse and may not be there when it heals and you feel better and you're strong again in a whole different way than you were before. All I get to see is the pain I caused and the, and the ugliness of the open bleeding you know, stuff. And, and that's, I have to be willing to live beyond my how hard this is gonna be in the moment, in the generation, in a couple generations, to get to the point where I can say for my great, great, great grandchildren, who I'm not even gonna have because I don't have any kids, but for your great, 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 great grandchildren, I believe that this has to happen now in order for that to be a healthy place when they're born. And so um, that's another thing that I think, along with not wanting to see it, uh, we have to get as a as a, a as human beings is uh, and every culture has the same story there's somebody who plants a seed for a fruit tree who's not uh, who's not going to live long enough to eat the fruit and they do all the hard work and they water it and they take care of it and then they die with the hope that it will feed the next generation and we actually have to like think of ourselves as like we have to think of ourselves that way. Not what's the conflict going to feel like in my generation? What's it going to do to the people I know? Although I want it to be as easy as it can be. I don't want to hurt anybody now if unnecessarily, but if I don't if we don't do something radical then generations from now are still going to be living in this same muck. And, and that's, the, um, that's the challenge. We, uh, in the hospital world, uh, so I do patient safety stuff now as part of my work. Um, do you know that 460,000 people a year in the United States die because of hospital-caused injury or, or um, infection? In Texas... 59 people die every day because a hospital screwed up. 59 people. And so 
the airline industry, can you imagine if 59 people in a, in a single state died every day in an airplane crash? Would anybody ever fly again? No. So the airline industry had to do something extremely radical. They had to come up with something that, that was uh, called high reliability. They have to be 100% sure there is not going to be an accident. Now, still, there are accidents. There's human error. And there are things that fail, but not in the numbers that we're seeing in the hospital world. And I think the same thing is true in the, um, in the Middle East, that people say, or like what happens in the hospitals is people say, um, well, falls are always going to happen. We can cut it down a little bit, but we can't fix it because people are always going to fall. You know, you, get, you, take a, you take a medication, you get dizzy, you fall. You hurt yourself. And I'm like, well, what if we can get 100% no falls? How do you get there? You got to start there. And I think the same thing is true with the Middle East. If we can't imagine the possibility of a healed world there in a different way than where you can't recreate the same stuff and expect it to be different, but we have to do something radical. If we can't imagine that in the future, we're always going to fall short and the situation's always going to be bad. It's just like that's, that's where we live. We, we all on some level have to find our own little bit of radical self. It doesn't have to all be, it can't all be about the same issue. But like you have to find your radical self and say, what is it that I would like to see different in the world? And if I don't, if I don't imagine that at 100% fixed, then I can't expect it to ever get better. It's just, it's, like then all we're doing is kind of band-aiding things and the infection will grow and it will grow and get worse. And, and yes, it will be painful for a number of years. It's painful now. I mean, what happens is that the people who are comfortable going to the beach are going to be less comfortable. And the people who are uncomfortable because they don't have enough water will be more comfortable. And they'll hate each other. This generation. And the next generation might grow up with uh, like, oh, we all have water, so now we can start talking. Or maybe it's two generations away. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I'm willing to risk that. Because what we're doing now ain't going to, you know, ain't going to fix it. One more question. All right, thanks, Rabbi. Thank you.